today we're going to look at topics in chapter 7, optics and wave effects. So we'll follow the pattern, share PowerPoints. And eventually we'll share PowerPoints. There we go. All right. So in chapter six, we, we looked at waves in general and then uh, specific examples in uh, uh, particularly sound waves. Um, but light travels in waves also. And, uh, but over the decades, there's been a controversy raging and, and still we just kind of threw up our hands and said, all right, um, one camp says, light is waves and the other camp says why light is particles so we eventually just threw up our hand and says okay lights both just depends on what answers you're looking for in this chapter we're going to look at light as a wave and the consequences of being a wave are explored in this case uh, through optics So we know that light, <clears throat> when it strikes certain objects, can be reflected. Um, now, it depends on the condition of the reflecting surface as that determines what happens to the wave when it's, inflect, when it's reflected. Um, this bouncing off can either be off of um, very regular called specular surfaces. They're very smooth. And we normally think of mirrors. Or they can be off of irregular surfaces and produce a diffuse reflection. And these uh, each have their applications. Uh, lighting in your home is best when it's diffuse. In other words, any light reflected in your home is easier on the eyes if it's reflected off of irregular surfaces. However, uh, when, uh, we, when we want to look at ourselves and see uh, a representation of ourselves in a mirror, we don't want a diffuse surface. We want a regular specular surface. So this is what they would look like uh, at the uh, molecular level. The regular reflective surface is very smooth and the incoming light uh, bounces off in a predictable fashion. Whereas a, an irregular surface for a diffuse reflection, um, the light could bounce any direction and does. <clears throat> now it's useful to, to think of light um, for purposes of judging how the light is reflected, we look at light in terms of what we call a ray, which is a straight line representation of the path that light will take. It's just an arrow. If we have several of those arrows together, uh, parallel to one another, then we call that a beam. Okay, if we have just one light ray approaching a specular surface, a smooth surface, and it strikes a surface, then it will bounce in a predictable fashion. And that obeys the law of reflection. The law of reflection simply says that the angle of reflection equals the angle of incidence. But as with all angles, you need to define uh, the two lines that uh, trap the angle. And in this case, the light ray gives you one line and the, a line that's perpendicular to the surface is the other line. We call it the normal. So the angle of incidence is between the incident ray 
and the normal, right? This angle, this theta angle here is the angle of incidence. Well, when it strikes the surface and bounces off, the angle of reflection between the reflected ray and the same normal is equal to the angle of incidence. So these two angles are equal to one another. That is the law of reflection. And by the way, uh, all of this happens in the same plane. In other words, this slide, we can be viewed as a uh, flat surface, defines the plane. So this incident ray is coming in on the plane of the uh, monitor, and then it bounces off in the same plane. Now we can use these rays to uh, trace the direction of the light that is reflected from a surface. And we call this a ray diagram. This is an example. We have an object down here, this candle, and then we have the mirror that is silvered on the side where the, the eye is located. And we can track light beams from that candle. Uh, one might go this direction and strike the, the surface here. And its angle of incidence against the normal is this value. And the angle of reflection is there. So it bounces off at that angle. However, another ray might emanate from that same point. And it may strike the light, the uh, mirror here. Gives a different angle of incidence and a different angle of reflection. So the, the consequence of this ray, A, is that direction, and a B is this direction. And if we, if, we, if we track backwards through the mirror, this reflected ray, it will take us back to a point that is, uh, that corresponds to uh, an image of the object. Now we're going to we're going to talk about this in a little more detail uh, and how to construct ray diagrams for reflective surfaces. But this is what it would look like for a flat surface. Uh, curved mirrors will do the same thing. The difference being that for a flat surface like this, this normal here is parallel to that normal. But for a curved surface, this normal will not be parallel. In other words, if that mirror were curved, then one normal might go off in this direction and another normal might go off in this direction. So wherever that ray strikes the surface of the mirror, that's where you establish the normal to that surface. All right. Um, reflected light, it's, it's all around us. In other words, if light were not reflected, then some places would not be illuminated. Right? You can see from this picture that there's direct lighting from the sun. You can see from the shadow that the sun is off in this direction up here. Right? And only the places, if we did not have reflection, only the places that were illuminated directly by the sun would be light. And obviously, <laughs> if there were no reflection, we wouldn't see it anyway, correct? But other areas of the house are illuminated not by direct sunlight, but by reflected light. And these areas, the shaded areas, uh, receive some sunlight, sunlight uh, by reflection. And of course, we receive all the information from that house by reflected light from its surface. Now here we have a, a plane mirror, perfectly flat surface. And this just illustrates the fact that uh, if this person wants to see her entire body, this mirror needs to be half her height. So this is her whole height, this is half her height, and the reflection from this mirror 
will give her a full image of herself. And it doesn't matter where her eyeballs are. I mean, she could have an eyeball here in her hand and uh, she would still need a mirror that's half her height. Notice that uh, from this level, light reflected from this level bounces off this part of the mirror into her eye. Well, where does this one go? Well, this one could bounce off of this mirror and end up, since these angles are the same, would end up in her eye. But what if we shortened the mirror? Say the mirror was here. And this light beam traveled up here. Then it would have a steeper angle. Right? It would have an angle steeper than that because the point of impact would be up here. So we go from her foot up to here and that angle would be steeper on both sides. The angle of incidence would be greater, the angle of reflection would be greater, and the light beam would go off in that direction, never reach her eye. So the mirror has to be half her height in order to show full image. If the mirror is plain, is flat. Now that was a discussion of reflection We'll come back to that in a few minutes. But since light can be viewed as a wave, not only does it reflect, but uh, it refracts. Now, what is refract? Refraction is the bending of a light wave uh, as it passes from one medium to another. In other words, if light uh, enters the surface of calm water, then it will bend because the, uh, the medium is of a different, uh, we'll talk about this later, but refractive index. In other words, the light enters the surface of the water and it changes direction. That's the whole point of refraction. The light wave bends at the surface of the water. Now, why does it do that? Well, it does that actually because its speed changes. Remember, I said, uh, mentioned, uh, chapter six, I believe it was, that the speed of light in a vacuum is 2.9979 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, or rounded off three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. That's in a vacuum and very close to that in air. But when light interacts with matter, it has to slow down, right? It has to take time to interact with the matter. If the matter is transparent, then it will move through the matter, but on its way, it's got to interact. And that slows it down. So the, uh, the difference in speed from one medium to the next accounts for the change in direction. Now this is only possible if we treat light as a wave, okay? Let's see, I'm getting there. We need to define uh, the difference between media in terms of their index of refraction. That is, how does the medium quantitatively change the speed of light? And it's always compared to the speed of light in a vacuum. Right? So we, we ratio the speed of light through the medium under investigation with the speed of light in a vacuum. Right? And that index of refraction is this expression. Right? The index of refraction, of course, the index of refraction is a dimensionless number. There are no dimensions. So you need to know where it comes from to be able to use it, right? There's no clue from the units of measure as to what that number means, unless you say what it means. So the index of, index of refraction is based upon the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in the medium. And we give that a uh, small letter N is the variable assigned to that value. 
So notice that light travels fast and no faster in a vacuum. In other words, any other medium through which light travels slows it down. So the speed of light in a vacuum is always going to be the larger number compared to the medium. What does that mean? Well, that means um, that means that the number is always greater than one or equal to one, which is unlikely because uh, if light has to travel through a medium, then the ratio is going to have a smaller denominator and make a number greater than one. So this n value is always greater than one. It may only be slightly greater than one, but it's always greater than one. So this is um, uh, an abbreviated version of the formula. N, index of refraction, equals C, which is the variable for the speed of light. Actually, it's a constant. The constant for the speed of light, and then this is the speed of light in the medium. Okay? So what does that mean? If we look at the number n, if n gets bigger, that means the medium slows the speed of light down more and more and more. The larger the n, the slower the speed of light in that medium. And as a consequence, you get a greater refraction, a larger angle change in direction. And I'll show you that, uh, that in just a second. Okay, these are some common substances. Uh, water has an index of refraction of 1.33. So the speed of light in water is 33% less than it is in a vacuum. Crown glass, which is a type of glass, is 50% slower. Uh, diamond, in fact, is uh, has the largest index of refraction of any naturally occurring substance that we know of, 2.42. Air is very close to the vacuum, and here's our reference point, vacuum. Uh, the N would be one, of course. When you ratio something to itself, you always get one. All right, there are some man-made substances that have higher indices of refraction than diamond. But there's no naturally occurring substance that has a higher index of refraction than diamond. All right. So I got a little explanation here, a little video, uh, to go along with this information. So what you're going to see in this video is a demonstration of what happens to a wave front. Remember, first we talked about rays, and then we talked about beams. You can also think of light as a wave front. In other words, uh, the wave is moving this way, toward the surface. And when it impacts the surface like that, what happens? Well, parts of the wave impact the surface first. So they experience the um, change from one medium to the next first, and then the rest of the wave follows along. Okay, let's watch the video. Well, first encounters a piece of glass. One side is slowed down before the other, forcing the wave front to change direction. This bending of light, whether in glass, water, or any other transparent material, is called refraction. Light is refracted closer to the direction perpendicular to the interface whenever it enters a medium that slows it down. This occurs no matter what the direction is. Okay. <clears throat> so hopefully that was um, a good explanation of what happens to the wave as it approaches the interface. So what they're showing you here is 
an interface and we can look at it in terms of the ray, right? Approaching at this angle, right? And when it strikes the surface, here's your, your normal to the surface and there's an angle of incidence here. Okay? What happens is if you extend this normal into the medium and this is um, this is N1 and this is N2. Right? This has a refractive index of N1, this one of N2, and in this case N2 is greater than N1. So the the higher this slows the light beam down the light wave slows down going from this one to this one. All right. So what happens? Well, it always, when this is the denser one, the angle now decreases to this theta of refraction. This angle of refraction decreases from that one as long as this one is the higher index of refraction. Okay. Um, you can think of when you're, when you're watching that wave approach. First encounters a piece of glass. What? We'll cut the sound out. Notice here, what's happening? You're getting a bending because uh, where the, the wave impacts the surface, the interface between the two surfaces, it slows down. It's kind of like um, a chariot race, right? A Roman chariot race where you have four horses abroad. They have to go around a curve. Which one goes slower? The one on the inside goes slower, right? It slows down. So they change direction. So that's what's happening here. You get an anchor point here, here, and it gradually moves out here. And that anchor point causes the rest of the wave to bend. Um, let's see. You'll also notice that these wave fronts are close to one another, right? Closer than the approaching wave. So what does that happen? What, what does that mean? That means this wavelength decreases when it goes from, uh, from the, this medium to the higher index medium. Now the frequency doesn't change. The frequency is established uh, at its source when it's created. But the wavelength changes. And as the wavelength decreases, so does the speed. Right? So C is proportional to wavelength. The speed of the wave decreases as the wavelength decreases. Because frequency is constant. All right, so here's another way of looking at it also. You have these two rays, right? We could have a whole bunch of them and make a beam, but wherever they uh, impact, we're going from air to glass, and glass has a higher index of refraction. Right? Then the, the angle here is smaller than the incident angle, just like this. It always happens. When you go from uh, the smaller index medium to the higher index medium, the beam always bends toward the normal. If we were going back the other direction, let's see what that would look like. If the beam were originating from here, from inside this medium and going to a, a lower index medium, then you would have 
this theta would be the angle of incidence. And going from the larger to the smaller index medium, the ray bends away. So this theta here is greater than this one. Notice that if the beam were coming back from this direction, it would be, it would repeat this phenomenon. So they're really just kind of, kind of uh, mirror images of one another. Okay. So what is the speed of light in water, right? We've, we've defined, we've defined what N is, correct? N is equal to C in a vacuum for light, and this C is the median. And this is the vacuum. Okay, so if you want to know the speed of light in water, you need to know the index of refraction for water. Right? Index of refraction is 1.33. The speed of light here is three, rounded off to two places, 10 to the eighth meters per second, divided by C of water. So there you have an equation in one unknown. You can solve it. Just put this one over here, this one over here, divide 1.33 into that, and you got your speed of light uh, in water. Okay. 2.26 times 10 to the eighth. Okay. So what are some natural examples of refraction? Well, if you were ever an astronomer like I was in my youth, This particular example of refraction is very annoying. Stars twinkle at night. They twinkle because of the difference between the speed of light in a vacuum, which is space, and the speed of light in air. But it's not consistent uh, because the refractive index of air changes with the density of air, the humidity, the temperature, very, lots of variables. And light is traveling from the star to the Earth through layers of atmosphere with different characteristics. So this one place, it might go that direction, and this place, it might go that direction again, and it might go this direction, and it might go that direction. That's what causes the twinkling. All right. Other examples. The mirage. All right. The mirage. So what's a mirage? <laughs> well, <laughs> typically we see the mirage being used in uh, desert environments. But you can see them anywhere. Since the refractive index of air depends on the density of the air and the temperature of the air, then um, the surface of the earth, if it's heated by the sun, right? It's heated by the sun. Where is it hottest? It's hottest right here next to the surface, which means the refractive index here is the lowest. So there's one refractive index. There's another one. There's another one. There's another one as we go up, right? And we're increasing the refractive index as we get further away from the hot surface. So what happens? Well, if something out here 
um, is sending a light beam here. So what's it going to do? Well, as it goes through through to the more dense, it goes from the less dense to the more dense, and actually it gets less and less dense this way. Uh, it changes directions several times on its way. In fact, it's rather a continuous change in index of refraction. And what you actually see uh, in a mirage is not the object, really, it's the sky. You see the sky, and through these various refractions, you get... you see the sky instead of what's on the surface. Um, if you've ever tried to catch a fish by hand or spear a fish from the surface, um, it's difficult because you're seeing, you're seeing the fish underwater Right? So here's water. And you're seeing the fish. Remember the light's coming from the fish and as it strikes the surface, which way is it going to bend? From higher index to lower index, it bends away from the normal. Right? So it's going to be like this. So if you're looking at this, let's, let's put the eyeball down here. If you're looking at this, you think the head of the fish is over here. Not here. So if you think it's over here, then you reach for it over there. And it's not there. Okay. That's a practical example of uh, uh, refraction. All right, so here's actually an image. What you're seeing here is a reflection of the sky up there. Looks like water, doesn't it? Well, if you get thirsty enough in a desert environment, you might think it's water and run toward it. And as you get closer, the angle of viewing changes and the water disappears. Okay, now <clears throat> let's talk about, remember that situation where a light begins in the higher index medium. <coughs> okay, in this case N2 is greater than N1. So this is the higher index medium. And if a light beam comes in like this, then it's going to go off like that. Right? This theta and this theta, this one is greater than that one. The light bends away from the normal. Well, what if you keep if you keep bending this one like that, now the light beam is going to be like this. And there comes a time where you bend it like this, and the light beam runs parallel to the surface. Right? And if you just keep bending this one, then you get, actually, the light beam doesn't exit the medium. It reflects back into the medium. Okay? That's called internal reflection. Here's an example. Right? At this angle, it bends away from the normal, a little more away from the normal as the angle increases. Right? And when you finally get to this angle, the angle of refraction is 90 degrees. At that point, this angle here 
theta c is the critical angle. Anything greater than the critical angle will produce internal reflection. The light will be reflected back into the medium. And in fact, it's very near 100%, very efficient. And we use, uh, this is otherwise known as total internal reflection. We use that characteristic in optical devices because all mirrors, all mirrors are less than 100% efficient. Some of them very much less. Uh, but uh, internal reflection is almost 100% efficient. So if you can construct uh, a device in the light path of your optical device that will take advantage of this total internal reflection, then you won't lose you'll lose practically no light at all in the process of changing direction through that device. Binoculars use these. The, the expensive binoculars do. Cheap binoculars still use mirrors. All right. So that's what the, the authors of the textbook are calling reflection by refraction. So you get total internal reflection at any angle greater than the critical angle. Okay. Now, um, depending on how large your index of refraction is, the critical angle here, let's back up. The critical angle will be uh, much less. In other words, you will not have to have a very large critical angle if the index of refraction is very large. So this critical angle varies with the index of refraction of the medium, the higher index medium. So if we had something as high as diamond, 2.4 index of refraction, this critical angle will be very small. So once you get light into the diamond, then you can get uh, total internal reflection and the, the brilliance will come back at you. Any light entering the diamond will come straight back out. And that's what's commonly called the fire of the diamond. And this particular cut, the brilliant cut, takes best advantage of total internal reflection for the diamond. And the dimensions are, are, are uh, uh, well known, defined. And the diamond cutters know what they are. And they will produce a, a brilliant cut diamond based upon those optical parameters. Here's one example. This bench up here, they call it, is a distance of D. From the base of the bench to the apex of the diamond is 2D. And of course, these other facets are cut at prescribed angles as well. You want to get the light in, but you want to send it right back out. Okay. Uh, another place that we use total internal reflection uh, more and more these days than ever before is in fiber optics. Uh, fiber optics is a, a branch of optics that studies the ability of light to travel through a fiber, usually a glass fiber, and uh, travel great distances within the fiber because of internal reflection. If the fiber is narrow enough, then the light cannot um, angle, cannot have such a steep angle that any light will escape. So the narrow fiber allows the light to stay within the fiber by in total internal reflection. 
Now we guarantee the fact that it will do that by coating that fiber with another, what, what we call cladding, another substance that has a uh, greater, uh, that has a smaller index of refraction. So this would be the, the fiber, the optical fiber. And then we would have the cladding up here where N1 is less than N2. That way you're guaranteed to have um, total internal reflection of the light through that fiber. All right. Now I have this, this discussion is, is of a, um, a law that was proposed by uh, uh, Snell. It's not in your textbook, but we do have some uh, lab exercise that, that uses the Snell's law. And I wanted to explain that to you so that when you get to that laboratory exercise, uh, you won't be totally lost. Snell's law actually quantifies the angles here, the angles of refraction. Snell's law quantifies that. And this is what it looks like. Okay. So if you have an incident ray here and it strikes a substance that uh, and the boundary is between an index of refraction lower than the one into which it's entering, then obviously you get a bending of the light toward the normal. So theta 2 is less than theta 1. Now what happens is some of that light is reflected. This surface creates a reflective surface, but it also allows some of the light to enter it. So there will be a division. So much a percentage of light will go reflected and a percentage will be refracted into the substance. In this case, water. Okay, there's a law that relates these angles uh, and the index of refraction for each of these substances. All right, and here it is. This angle of incidence, number one, take the sine of it. That's a trigonometric function. Now, if you've not had trigonometry, um, that's okay, because your calculator will do that calculation for you. If you know the angle in degrees, then there's a key on your calculator that you can punch and it'll give you the sign of that angle. Then of course you're given the index of refraction for the two uh, media. So the index of refraction for one times sine of the theta equals the index of refraction of the second medium times sine of its theta, the refracted ray. Okay, so I'm going to work a problem for you in just a minute. This can go backwards or forwards, right? If the ray originates inside, then uh, theta one is on the inside of the, the uh, higher index medium, and the theta two is in the lower index medium. Okay, so let's say light strikes an air water surface at an angle of 46 degrees with respect to the normal. Okay, find the angle of refraction when the direction of the ray is from air to water and then from water to air. So this 46 degree angle is different for these two examples. So here's what it would look like. For the first sample, A, right here, this A, the light is traveling from air into water. So this theta is 46 degrees, 46 degrees from normal, right? And this angle over here, any light that's reflected will be at the same angle. 
but this theta is related to this one using Snell's law. Okay? So here we have Snell's law set up. In other words, we solved for the unknown. So this angle is the unknown. Here it is, sine theta sub two. And here is the index of refraction for air and the angle in air. And this is the index of refraction for water. So here we have uh, one, which is nearly one for air, which is a close approximation. And then the angle, right? And divided by the index of refraction for um, water. Now notice this calculation you punch in sine 46 degrees into your calculator and it gives you a number times one divided by 1.33. Easy. And that calculation gives you 0.54, but that's not the angle, right? Sine theta two equals this value. So we need to find out what theta two is relative to this sine, all right? There's another key in your calculator Uh, if you find the sine key, sine key, then there's another key, usually There's another key on your calculator. Usually, it's a, uh, you push the function key and it changes the sine key into the reverse. It's called the arc sine, or it might be listed as A-S-I-N on your calculator. That goes in the other direction. So if you punch in this number and hit arc sine, it'll give you the angle that's associated with that sine. So that's how you work backwards. Right? So the angle is actually 33 degrees. Right? So this angle is 33 degrees. It was 46 coming in, bending toward the normal, right? Because of the higher index, 33 degrees. Now if we go the other direction, in the other direction, you have um, this incident ray is coming from within the higher index median, right? So in this case, the 1.33 goes on top, right? Because it's related to this medium. And then you divide by one. So that calculation gives you 0.96 and the arc sine of 0.96 is 74 degrees. So now this value here on the refracted uh, ray is 74 degrees. All right. Takes a little practice, but um, I'm not asking you to learn trigonometry, just to learn how to use these calculations. All right. So let's move to the topic of dispersion. What do we mean by dispersion? Well, dispersion is related to refraction. Dispersion is related to refraction in, the, in that the refractive index of, our, of any substance is uh, fixed for a given wavelength of light. And the index of refraction will change with the wavelength of light. So actually that's fortunate because we can use dispersion uh, and this, these changes of index of refraction for the different wavelengths, we can use that to take uh, a mixture of light, say white light, and uh, spread the colors out 
because they will come out at different angles. Right? That's how a prism works. So when we refract a, a white light beam, we will get a rainbow of colors simply because the index of refraction for the, the glass of the prism uh, varies with the wavelength. And usually the index of refraction is uh, in reference manuals is quoted for a given wavelength. Um, I'm not sure what it is. I think in, in the neighborhood of maybe 600 nanometers. Don't hold to me to that, but uh, it, when the index of refraction is quoted in a reference manual, it will also give you the wavelength at which that index of refraction is valid. And what we'll also notice is that blue light is more strongly refracted than red. So the index of refraction for the blue end of the spectrum near 400 is a higher number than the index of refraction for red light near the 700 mark. Okay. <clears throat> so this is just a reminder of the, uh, the formulas that we've used before. <clears throat> and if we substitute we know that the index of refraction is equal to the speed of light divided by the speed of light in the medium, speed of light in vacuum divided by the speed of light in the medium. And we've solved for the speed of light in the medium. Uh, then we can substitute the lambda and frequency for the speed of light in the medium, right? We can put this one in here goes right into that place right there. Right? Put that in there, and that gives you this formula. So the index of refraction is equal to the speed of light in the vacuum divided by the wavelength times the frequency. So what does that mean? That means that the index of refraction for our substance varies inversely with the wavelength which means the index of refraction, uh, as the lambda decreases, the index of the refraction increases. And that's just what I said a minute ago. As the wavelength decreases, you move toward the blue end, and the index of refraction increases, and vice versa. For the, uh, if the lambda increases, then you get a decrease in index of refraction. So that explains why shorter wavelengths are more, the angle of refraction is greater than it is for, uh, uh, for blue is greater than it is for red. Okay, so this is what you'll see with a, a prism, right? As the white light enters, the more the greater the refraction occurs for a blue light or a violet light on this end of the spectrum and lesser for the red light. Um, so uh, you can choose the medium, right? Um, a diamond with a higher index of refraction at a given wavelength than for other substances, say glass, will uh, disperse light more efficiently, more widely dispersed through the diamond than for uh, other substances. And that's where these stones get their, what we call their fire. Fire referencing not just the brilliance, but the mix of colors. All right. Now, in the sciences, we use this 
phenomenon of dispersion for quantitative analysis of different materials. And to do that, we use a spectrometer. Spectro meaning spectrum of light and meter meaning measure. So we measure the spectrum. So when we separate light into its components, um, maybe the light source from some distant object uh, is not pure white light. It doesn't have every wavelength in it. It may only have certain wavelengths. And those wavelengths that are in that light beam that we now spread out and look at um, are characteristic of elements at that distance. So with a properly calibrated instrument, you can actually measure the wavelength of the various components that are dispersed in the spectrometer from that light beam. Now this is based upon the uh, physical phenomenon of emission. In other words, when you heat a substance up, then it will emit light at characteristic wavelengths. And if there are several wavelengths at which the emission takes place, they will come to us in a bundle, say from a distant star. That light will come to us in a bundle and the spectrometer spreads it out so that we can look at individual wavelengths. And by characterizing uh, substances based upon the wavelengths that they prefer to emit, we can say with a a fair degree of confidence that emissions are coming from a known element or compound from that star. Now we don't use it just for stars, of course. We can use it in the laboratory. Um, I used to operate an instrument in the laboratory called, uh, this is inductively coupled argon plasma spectrometer. What it would do was it would take a prepared sample uh, from either a soil extract or a, a plant digestion and it would inject that into this flame. But that flame was composed of argon and the argon was being excited by induction. And we're gonna cover induction in the next chapter. So hold on to that thought. But this flame is very hot. 10,000 K, extremely hot. So it excites every atom in the sample. And then up here, it continues to rise and as we remove it from the heat source, the atoms relax and they emit light of a characteristic, uh, several characteristic wavelengths for each element. And this light beam would be sent into the spectrometer where the light would be dispersed and the detector would pick up uh, characteristic wavelengths for given elements. And then it would measure the intensity of the light at that wavelength, and it, was, it would be correlated with a concentration of the element in the sample. That way we could tell what element is in the sample and how much of it is there. Okay, so that's how a spectrometer works. And it works, and here's an example, right? For hydrogen, um, you get four lines of visible light. One, two, three, four. Those are characteristic of hydrogen. Helium, you get these 
characteristics, one, two, three, four, five, six lines. Now, there is um, a reason for that, right? And we'll discuss that when we, it's probably in the second semester when we talk about chemistry. Um, or we may get a little bit in, when we talk about the, uh, the atom in subsequent chapters in this, uh, this semester's course. But notice that they're characteristic. These, these lines aren't the same for each element. So what my instrument would do is just pick out one of them. And usually the one that was uh, least interfered with by other elements and was very strong, a strong emitter. And that way I could tell what elements are there and how much of each element there is. Okay, now we're gonna talk about uh, optics. In other words, uh, how can we use, first of all, the law of reflection to uh, focus light and create images by reflection. And after that, we'll follow that up with uh, refraction and how do we use lenses to produce images. All right. So we're going to start off with spherical mirrors. That's the very simplest curved surface. Right? Simply because it's a section of a sphere. It's very easy to produce a spherical section like that. And the, the spherical mirror can either be reflective on this side or can be reflective on the other side. Now it has a, a radius of curvature. In other words, the sphere from which it comes will be, uh, let's say, right there is R. So this radius is the same all the way around like that. That's our radius of curvature. Uh, excuse me. Sphere. Ah, yes, okay. Um, and then there's another value. The, the C value is the center of curvature of the sphere. Uh, they should be equal, actually. Hold on a second. Yes. Okay. Actually, this point here is C. And this distance is R. Okay. I want to be consistent with the authors here. Now, the principal axis is a line drawn from C through the uh, center of the mirror. In other words, it bisects the mirror. So here, that's our uh, principal axis. Okay. And this point right here is called the vertex. That's the point where the principal axis intersects the mirror. Now there's another point, the focal point, which for a spherical mirror, the focal point is exactly half the distance between C and V. Right? And the focal length is right here. Okay, so that defines our spherical mirror. Center of curvature, radius, vertex, principal axis, focal point, and focal length. Okay. <clears throat> At least I drew it right. If the inner surface is, is the mirror, then we have a concave or converging mirror. 
that is light entering here will be reflected off of that surface and toward a point. If, however, the light comes, if the um, outer surface of the mirror, excuse me, I'm going to go to the next slide. I'll come back. If the outer surface is silvered, then any light beam here will be diverging. But if you draw lines here, like that, then they will converge on the focal point. Okay, let me go back. There we go. So let's go back to the one where we have a converging mirror. There we go. A converging mirror. If the light rays are parallel to the principal axis, then the, uh, the beam, or each ray, will bounce off the surface and pass through the focal point. So if we have a ray coming in this way, then it will bounce and end up there. Okay? And the law of reflection still applies. The normal to that surface is right here. So this theta and this theta are equal. Okay? But if we have another light beam coming in here, then it will also end up at the focus. And here we have a different theta, but the law of reflection still holds for that point, for that ray. Now, um, this is true for parallel rays coming in. For rays that are not parallel to the axis, they will focus off-center. And what we have here is a focal plane. So if the light is coming in at an angle, then it'll focus on the plane right there. All right. Now that's a problem with spherical mirrors. If the incoming light rays are off axis, then you don't get a good image at the focal point. So we'll talk about that later. So this is what a parallel, parallel light rays would look like. They actually uh, converge at the focal point. The diverging mirror, light rays that are parallel to the principal axis are reflected such that they appear to diverge from the focal point. So if they come in like this, then they bounce off like that. And if we draw this, this ray extension back here, it appears to originate from the focus, from the focal point. So what does that actually do? Well, it expands the um, field of view. That's why in uh, supermarkets and uh, in uh, outside of driveways that ha that are that have uh, blind spots where two roads intersect, you may have a a a convex mirror set up on the side of the road so that you can see in all directions and not run out into traffic. Or uh, if you're in, say, a, a department store, there may be a mirror up in the corner somewhere that's shaped like this, and it gives uh, any of the workers there a broad field of view. A 
broad field of view to uh, surveil any uh, potential shoplifters. This is what it would look like. Right? So these rays are parallel to the principal axis. Okay. Um, and since this side is the reflective side, the diverging rays tend to originate, appear to originate from the focal point. But the law of reflection still holds the angle of this incoming ray to the normal is the same as the reflective ray. Now, let's talk about ray diagrams a little more because this helps us to decide when we are uh, using a mirror to form an image of an object. Where will it form and how big will it be? That's where ray diagrams help. So ray diagram for mirrors are built this way. So we, we typically represent the object as an arrow. So this is kind of messy. Let me just erase this. Actually, I think I've got some pretty good graphics here, so I won't have to draw them for a ray diagram. We represent the object as an arrow, and then we represent the image as an arrow with a dash rather than a straight line arrow, a dashed arrow. And what we're able to do is uh, plot the location of the image, the orientation of the image. I mean, is it upright or is it inverted? And the size, how big is it? And we only have to draw two rays to do that. Okay. This is in words. I'll show you a picture in a minute. The first ray is drawn parallel to the principal axis and is reflected through the focal point. Okay. Where does it start from? Usually starts from the tip of the arrow. And then the second ray is drawn through the center of curvature to the mirror surface and reflected directly back. And this one also starts from the tip of the arrow. Okay, the intersection of those two rays is the position of the image. All right, so what does that look like? All right, so here's our, our convex mirror, excuse me, our concave mirror with a reflective surface on the inside. Here's the object. And the first way we draw parallel to the principal axis. This one right here, right? And where does it reflect to? It goes through the focal point. So we just draw it on through. So there's the first one, there, 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 okay? The second one we draw here through the center of curvature. Now all the way down and it bounces straight back. So where do they intersect? Right here. That's the tip of the arrow right there. So this image is inverted, right? And it's also a real image, right? I'll define real and uh, virtual in just a second. Okay, that's one example. If we move the object to another position, the image will move, right? Um, just put it in different places. Say, move this over here and say, what does that do? Or move it out here and try it again. See where that happens. There are two other um, measurements that can be drawn from this ray diagram. One is the distance to the image. From the vertex to the image along the principal axis is D sub I, distance to the image. And along the principal axis from the vertex to the object, the base of the object, 
is the distance of the object. Okay, those two values. Okay, here's another possibility. So now we have the object here. It's between the focus, focal point, and the center of curvature. Right there. So we draw a parallel and bounce it through the focal point and just continue on. And then the other one, we draw bouncing off the mirror and going through the center of curvature. And here's where they meet. Okay, and in that process, we take this object, and now the image is inverted again, but it's larger than the object in this case. So when we put the object way out here, we got a small image, a small inverted image. When we put the object here, we get an inverted larger image. All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's another example. This is still a concave mirror, right? The reflective surface is here. So let's go back. I want to make a point. Here we go. In this case, the object is positioned beyond the center of curvature. When that happens, the image is real, inverted, and between the focal point and the center of curvature. When we move the object to between the focal point and the center of curvature, for this example, now the object is still real, but the, uh, I mean, excuse me, the image is still real, but now the image is beyond the center of curvature. So when you put the object between these two, you get the image out here, beyond the center of curvature. Now, the third case is where we put the object inside the focal point. Here, inside the focal point, now we draw our rays here, here, and then here, here. And these two rays do not meet on the front side of the mirror. They appear to come from the back side of the mirror. Okay, in that case, the image is virtual. Now, what do I mean by real? or virtual. Okay. Uh, it, the image could be called real or virtual. It could be upright or inverted, and we've seen that. It could be larger or smaller than the object. But we need to define what we mean by real and virtual. The other two are self-explanatory. Uh, let's see. I'll come back to those in just a minute. Here we go. Real image. A real image is best thought of as the image is formed in such a way that it can be projected onto a screen. Okay, that's a real image. Uh, for mirrors, the real image forms in front of the mirror where a screen can be positioned. So if the mirror is here, like this, then the screen has to be out here or here or here or here, wherever the, the case may be. But it has to be on the same side as the object. A virtual image, on the other hand, is formed by diverging rays. In other words, the image cannot be projected onto a screen, right? Because in that case where we had an image over here, like that, there's your image. Well, suppose this, this mirror was solid all the way over here. Where are you gonna put your screen? You can't. The light rays actually form here by diverging. Diverging rays do not focus a real image. All 
right? So they form behind or inside the mirror. Now, how do we deal with that? Right? Um, and in this case, the virtual image always forms when the object is inside the focal point. We noticed that about that previous mirror. So it would have to be, if this is the focal point, then the object would have to be there. Okay? But these types of optics are useful. The problem is we can't project the image directly from this mirror. So what do we have to do? We have to put this mirror into a system, an optical system, where the light can be gathered for that uh, virtual image and refocused, right? So a separate optical device is required to gather those rays and focus them into a real image. Cameras do that all the time. Our eyeballs do that too. Right? Because you could put an you could put your eye over here somewhere, right? And you could see that image because the eyeball focuses those rays for you. It's a separate optical device. That's the only way you can get a virtual image to project. All right, let's get, I know I skipped some stuff, so let me back up and be sure we cover all our bases. Here we go. All right. So these, we can characterize the, uh, the image as either real virtual, upright or inverted, larger or smaller than the object. I mentioned the distance. The object distance is d sub zero, just the distance of the object from the vertex. Uh, the uh, focal point, we've defined that. Size and orientation, we know how, how to do that with a ray diagram. The distance of the image from the vertex is d sub i. So in this case, d sub i would be this direction. And this would be d sub o. But if we are consistent with convention and signs, then anything on this side would be positive. This side would be a negative distance. Otherwise, we wouldn't know which, which direction we're going. Okay. So let's move to convex mirrors. Diverging mirrors. We draw the rays exactly the same way as with a concave mirror, but with a convex mirror, the image is always virtual. It's always upright, and it's always smaller than the object. Right? So in that way, it's actually a simpler process <laughs> than the concave mirror. We have three possibilities for the concave mirror, you know, outside the center of curvature, between focal point and curvature, or inside the focal point. But with a convex mirror, the image is, is always virtual, always upright, and always smaller than the object. Right, so it doesn't matter where we put the object, right? Here's the reflective surface, and there's the object. The image is always upright and smaller and virtual. But you draw the lines the same way. It's just with this one, draw it like this, and it bounces that way, that means you have to extend backwards toward the focal point or you go straight to that center, and it always gives you this upright virtual image.
So here's an example. Right? An object is placed 25 centimeters in front of a concave spherical mirror. Right? Here's the mirror. And where's 25 centimeters? Well, the center of curvature is 20 centimeters. Right? So it'll be a fourth of that distance. Right? So a fourth of that distance is here. So there's your object right there at 25 centimeters. Construct the ray diagram. So here we draw this ray, there, bounce it off through the focal point. And then this one goes through the center of curvature, and there where they meet is the top of your real image. Notice that this object is outside the center of curvature, so the image is going to be real and inverted. Um, center of curvature is 20, yes. That means that the focal point is 10 centimeters for a spherical mirror. Remember we said that. The center, the uh, C is always 2 times F. Or the, the distance to C is always 2 times the distance from the vertex to the focal point for a spherical mirror. Now we're going to put the object at 15 centimeters. So if this is 20 and that's 10, this is 15. And now where is the image form? Well, the image forms over here, right? We just draw our lines as before. There it is. C equals 20, uh, F is 10 centimeters, and there's our image. Now, if you draw this thing to scale, draw it to scale, then you can measure how far this is, how far is D sub I. And you can also measure how large is the image. But I don't think we're going to, uh, no. We're not gonna do the calculations for actual size of the images. That's just a little more than we can handle. Um, under the circumstances. So now let's switch to lenses. How do we deal with lenses? Well, let's get an idea of what a lens is. Right? Uh, lens can be made of any transparent material um, as long as the index of refraction of the lens is uh, greater than the index of refraction of the air most of them aren't used in vacuums, but in case, uh, it's greater than, uh, the index of refraction is greater than air. It can be made of plastic, like my glasses. They're polycarbonate, which makes them safety. Or they can be made of different types of glass. I think more and more glasses, uh, corrective lenses, are made from polycarbonate, a, a very durable polymer. Actually, um, it goes under the brand name of Lexan. Lexan is polycarbonate. And the shape of the lens then determines where the light goes. Two main types of lenses. There are uh, converging lenses or convex lenses. These are thicker at the center than at the edge. And diverging lenses, or concave lenses, thicker at the edges than they are in the center. So think of concave as cavity lenses. Right. There's a concave lens. And it has cavities on both sides. In fact, it's a, it's a biconcave lens. You can make lenses with a flat side on them, like that. And they'll still work. A convex lens is thicker in the middle. Like that. So when light approaches this one,
bands like that. When light approaches this one, bands like that. That's a diverging lens. This is a converging lens. Okay, here are some examples. Okay. This is a, a biconvex lens. This is a biconcave lens. And then this is a, a plano convex lens. Plane on one side, convex on the other. And this is a compound convex lens. You have a different curvature here on that side than you do on this side. And in fact, because this one is curved inward on that side and outward on this side, it has characteristics of both the converging and the diverging lens combined in one, as does this one. All right, so uh, many of the terms that we've used so far can also be used for lenses. They have a focal point, and they, they also have a center of curvature, but you don't need to know it for a lens. You only need to know the focal point. Rays that pass will pass through the lens, not reflected. We're talking about refraction now. So the light will enter the lens from one side and be refracted to a focal point on the other side. Except for, <laughs> that was for a converging lens, a convex lens. A concave lens will diverge the light beams and they will appear to have originated from the focal point on the same side that the light beam originated. Okay, so how do we handle ray diagrams for lenses? Well, it's similar to spherical mirrors, but not exactly the same. And here's what I mean by that. You can tell from a ray diagram in a lens the location of the image, its orientation, and its size by drawing two rays. But you really, you only need to know the focal point uh, for the surfaces of the uh, lens. We draw the first ray parallel to the principal axis, just like before. And that beam goes through the lens and is refracted by the lens through the focal point. So if this is the focal point, then this first beam goes here and there, like that, through the focal point. The second ray is drawn through the center of the lens, not through the center of curvature, uh, like we did with mirrors, but through the center. So from, uh, from here, say this is your object, then it would go through the center and meet out here somewhere. So there's your image. Okay. Here's our example. Right, there's the object. This light beam and for convenience, we usually draw the parallel light beam until it reaches the center of the lens and then we uh, angle it toward the focal point. And then we have this one goes straight through the center from that same point through the center of the lens and where they meet is the uh, tip of the arrow or the, the opposite of where we started. The distance of the object is on this side of the lens, the distance to the image is on that side. and a real image is formed. So this image can be uh, projected onto a screen. So as we get closer, 
this that's what this statement means the image gets larger as uh, F is approached so if the object gets closer and closer and closer to F then the image gets bigger now what happens when the object is placed inside the focal point okay when that happens then you draw the same line here like that and then here through the center of the lens but notice that the beams diverge so you cannot form a real image if the object is inside the focal point of the lens in fact what you form is a virtual image on the same side of the lens as the object so we can't project that one but you can use an external optical device to gather the light from this object on this side and focus it. So if I put my eye over here, I could focus that light onto my retina using my lens and I could see this image actually. I'd see this image from that object. So that's why when you, when you take a lens and you put it close to your eye and you look at something whatever you're inspecting, you're actually focusing a virtual image onto your retina. And the image is going to be bigger. So that's the magnifying quality of a single lens. When you put the object inside the focal point of your lens. Now here's a diverging lens. For a diverging lens, the image is always upright. So here's the image, there's the object, and it's always smaller than the object. Doesn't matter where you put the object, uh, the image will always be smaller. And it will be virtual. Because by its very nature, this lens diverges light. Right? Here's one beam going that way, here's the other beam going that way diverging. Now you can use an external optical device to do the same thing as before and capture that light and focus it onto a screen or onto your retina as the case may be. All right. So here's an example. This convex lens has a focal length of 12 centimeters. So the distance here to here is 12 centimeters. And because it's convex on both sides, the distance, this focal length is the same as that focal length, 12 centimeters. We have the object set at 18 centimeters out here. So we draw our rays and they converge over here and we produce a real image that's inverted and larger than the object. In this case, We've got the same lens with a 12 centimeter focal length, only this time the object is at 8 centimeters from the vertex. This forms a virtual image that's upright and on the same side as the object. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about um, deviations from the ideal. Um, and we can, we can talk about these deviations in terms of both lenses and mirrors. Spherical lenses and spherical mirrors. They both give you the same uh, types of deviation. We'll call them aberrations. Right. So notice with this spherical mirror, what can happen is if, the, if you're using a very large amount of the sphere, then these, 
the light doesn't focus at the right place. This is a spherical aberration. Same thing happens for this biconvex lens. You get light focusing at more than one place. So you get a blurry image. The, the whole reason for this is that light focuses at a different point as we move further and further from the center, the vertex of the uh, mirror or the lens. So how do you solve that problem? Well, one way is to use a small section of that curved surface. So if we only use their mirror from this part here, very narrow part right there, then all the light would focus right there. So we wouldn't have to deal with this part. So you either use that small part, just make your mirror small, or you can have a big spherical mirror and just put a mask over it. So it only receives light from that small area. Um, same thing with the lens. Just use the very smallest curvature part right here. And then you'll see that the focal point here will give you a sharp image. Uh, the other way is to um, your detector should be curved. So because they, they focus at different places, if you curve the detector, you will pick up light uh, at different points of the curve in the detector. And then that can be, that will generate a uh, sharp image. There are many telescopes that do that. Uh, use a spherical mirror because large spherical mirrors are much easier to grind than complex uh, shapes. So they just compensate not by the mirror, but by the detector. So they would have this curved surface here and the light would be coming in like that, like that, like that. And then the detector would be curved or a film if they want to take a photograph. The other way is to use corrective optics to actually correct the aberration. And there are several designs of telescopes in particular that do that. Okay. You can either take um, a lens out here of a very uh, a complex shape and it will change the direction of the light so that it will all come in and focus at that one point. Right. So that's a corrective optic of the incoming light or you can take the light that's coming out of here and send it through. You can collect the light after it's reflected and correct the optics there. Um, there's one other one. Yes. Especially with mirrors. That's in fact, uh, either way, lenses or mirrors, instead of using a spherical grind surface, Use a parabolic surface. So what does that mean? In practical terms, if this is a spherical surface, then use a parabolic surface with not quite as much bend in it. Then um, the light beams here would focus there, right? But if they, um, actually that's not true. Right, if they come from the outer edges, they're gonna focus in closer. So they focus in here, here. If they come in here, they focus there and there. And if they come in, um, very close to the center, they focus there. Right. But with a parabolic surface, 
way out here, there, here, there, here, there. With a parabolic surface, you can produce a good image at a single focal point from a very large curved surface. And the, the law of reflection still holds. Because you've bent this one out, then the angle that's created here gives you that focal point all the way out to the edge of the mirror. Now, um, and, and there are ways to produce parabolic surfaces. Uh, it's a skill, right? And even though I know how to do it, I've never done it before. So, um, in fact, <clears throat> in the world of amateur astronomy, uh, it's said that there are, there are two there are two classes of astronomers. There are the little telescope makers, those who are skilled at making lenses and uh, skilled at making mirrors. And then there are the users. I was a user. And there are some who can actually grind a parabolic surface. And it's fascinating the way you do it, but it takes a lot of patience. And if you make a mistake, then you can ruin uh, the blank, they call it. Anyway, uh, that's one way to correct a sphere collaboration is to grind a parabola, a parabola, not a sphere. Now, if you've had geometry, you know that parabola is a conic section. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but it's interesting. If you have a cone here, right there, and here's the center of the axis of the cone. If you draw, if you cut a plane through this, you get a circle. Right? If you cut uh, this way at an angle, you get an ellipse. Right? If you if you cut this way to where it's open down here then you get a parabola. And if you're parallel to this axis and you cut this way, you get a hyperbola. Right? Now, there are mathematical expressions for each one of these that you get from, uh, not geometry, but uh, trigonometry. But this is, these are conic sections. And this parabola is the one that gives you the correction for spherical aberration. All right. Here's another problem. It's called coma. It produces a, a blurry edge to the image. And it results from light entering the optical device, either the lens or the mirror, from an angle off axis. Right? So these light beams, these rays, are coming in not parallel to the principal axis, but with an angle to it. And what that does is it focuses light on the focal plane, not on the focal point. So your image looks like this or reflection, similar problem. And this is what it looks like in reality, this coma. Right? It produces a, a, an, actually a smeared image toward one side. Now, uh, another problem is called astigmatism. Well, let's talk about the solution. The solution to coma is um, you can use compound optics to correct for it. And very often you have a mask that limits the amount of off axis light that can be, uh, that can enter the uh, optical device. Astigmatism is a blurry image also 
but it results from a different curvature depending on the angle of axis. So if you have, if we take our mirror and turn it this way so that we can look at it this way. Okay, so there's a surface of the mirror and there's our vertex in the middle. The curvature on that mirror is different for this slice than it is for this slice or for that slice or for that slice, right? So if light hits it here, it's gonna focus somewhere here. If it hits it here, it's gonna focus at a different point, focus at a different point, you get all those different focal points, depending on the, the uh, angle around the vertex. And it's very common for the human eye to experience astigmatism. And that requires that your, your uh, optician, actually your, your um, optometrist or your ophthalmologist, whichever the case may be, uh, has to do some complicated measurements to determine what type of grind on your corrective lenses will correct for these different curvatures in your lens and correct for that astigmatism. So that's why uh, when your lens is designed to correct astigmatism, then if you rotate the lens, you lose that correction because it's based on the angle. That's why uh, for the longest time, people who have uh, astigmatism in their lenses Uh, could not wear contact lenses because contact lenses are free to rotate. So what they did was they invented a contact lens that was weighted. It had a large enough weight on one side so that it would keep it lined perfectly like that. Then the correction for astigmatism was always at the same angle. Okay, uh, you can also use compound optics, which that's what we do with our corrective lenses. I have astigmatism. Most people I know have astigmatism. Uh, and the optics of my corrective lenses uh, make allowances for that and correct the astigmatism in my lenses. Okay. Chromatic aberration. This results from what I described earlier as the uh, difference in refractive index based upon the wavelength of light. So a simple lens will take light and bend red not so much as blue. So if you if you draw a line down here like this you'll see maybe red in the center and green and then blue on the outer edges of your image. Let's see if I got a picture. Um, well, no, I thought I had a, I thought I had an image, but sorry. But you will see, um, and, and you'll see this in cheap telescopes, right? You buy uh, two and a quarter inch, uh, refractor telescope on a tripod for a couple of hundred dollars and go out in the night sky and look at your stars and all your stars will have um, a red in the center and, and blue rings around them and it's very annoying now this is this is only an aberration for lenses because it's based upon refraction Reflective lenses, mirrors, don't have this problem because they're based upon the law of reflection, which works for any wavelength. Um, so uh, how do we deal with it? Well, uh, again, if you use a small section of the lens near the vertex, then you can minimize the chromatic aberration because it's less pronounced near the axis. Or you can use a compound lens 
where one lens is converging and the other lens made out of a different index of refraction glass um, refracts the wavelengths differently than the convex lens. And it brings everything back into focus for all colors. So in this case, we have flint glass followed by crown glass, and we get a correction for chromatic aberration. Now, it's much more expensive to do it this way, but um, it does produce uh, good lenses with little or no chromatic aberration. There are a bunch of other aberrations that are possible. We don't have time to discuss them here. These are the main ones. And these are the ones that will show themselves in poorly designed and executed optics. All right, let's talk about the human eye. The human eye is, uh, has a lens in it, a convex lens. Right? So it focuses an image, a real image of the world onto the retina. Now the retina is curved, right? So um, the lens can be spherical and since the detector is curved, then it corrects for that spherical aberration. Okay, uh, this retina has receptors in it and if you take a Take a class in anatomy and physiology, you'll get more detail. But these photoreceptors are divided into two groups, rods and cones. Right? The rods uh, respond to any light, which means that they're grayscale, black and white. In other words, they, they, they just say, there's light there, yeah. How intense is it? Okay, we register a stronger signal for more intense uh, light beam. Cones, on the other hand, are designed to respond to colors. And they send different signals based upon the color they receive. But they're not as sensitive as rods. So cones are not very active in dim light. So if you're, if you're running around outside on a moonless night and all you have is starlight to light the way, everything looks black and white or grayscale. You need more light to see in color. Okay, um, the light that impinges upon these cells produces an electrical impulse. And that impulse is sent through the optic nerve to the brain. And the brain interprets that signal as an image. Okay, so the image is going to be inverted. Uh, on the retina. And the focal length, which means that depending on the distance of the object, the focal length of the lens must change. It cannot be fixed. Um, because the distance to the image is fixed. So when the distance to the object changes, the focal length of the lens must change. All right. Now, how do we deal with this? I mean, you, you look at the world around you, everything looks upside down. I mean, right side up. But on your retina, everything is upside down. So what happens? Well, the brain takes that, that upside down image and flips it for you so that you see the world right side up. It's magic. Um. But I've seen uh, results from experiments where volunteers were fitted with uh, spectacles that inverted the world. They turned everything upside down, right? So when you first put the glasses on, your brain naturally uh, takes that upright image and flips it 
till it's inverted. So you, you see the world where the ground's up here and the sky's down here. Well, it doesn't take very long. Keep wearing them. Your brain finally figures out that it needs to flip the image, and it does. It takes that right side image and reflips it to where it's right side up again. So you're wearing those glasses and everything looks right side up again. So the brain does the magic for you. Of course, when you take the glasses off, <laughs> after you've gotten used to them and the brain has made the conversion, take the glasses off, now everything's upside down again until your brain has a chance to figure out that it needs to be the other way around. Now this um, uh, fine tuning of the focal length occurs in the lens, but strange as it may seem, most of the light bending that takes place in the eye happens in the cornea, right here. 70% of the light bending in your eye takes place in the cornea. And the other 30% is the fine tuning for the focal length to the retina. And that all happens based upon these ciliary muscles. Right? If they relax, then the lens tends to bulge. If they contract, then they flatten the lens out and increase the focal length. If you let the lens get fatter, then you make it more convex and the light focuses closer, decrease the focal length. Now, obviously, um, human vision has its defects also. Most people, uh, very few people I should say, have perfect vision under all circumstances. So let's take a look at some of these defects. All right, first one is perhaps the most common, nearsightedness. Okay, what does nearsightedness mean? It means that, uncorrected, your eye sees better when the object is close to it. You see things that are near. If they're farther away, then the... Uh, the light, the rays are parallel and they focus in front of the retina. So here's your lens and here's the retina and here's your object. Right? So with if the light is parallel, then it focuses here in front of the retina. But if it gets closer, what happens? Well, these light rays that were parallel now are actually diverging. So if they're diverging and they're bent the same amount, they focus further down like that. So that's why you can see things closer if you're nearsighted. And things farther away, the, the rays become more parallel, closer to a parallel which means they focus in front of the retina. So all we need is a diverging lens that takes these um, distant light beam and sends them spreading so that now they focus further away and actually on the retina. This is nearsighted. The technical term for it is myopia. Opia, obviously, is, refers to the eye. And I'm not sure what my means. But this is the nearsightedness. All right. Uh, the, obviously, if there are nearsighted people, there are also farsighted people. Farsighted people see things better far away. Their lens uh, focuses behind the retina. So, OK. 
okay? So here's your lens. So if you see things far away, their light beam is going to be virtually parallel for uh, farsighted. So these are going to focus on the retina. If things get near, like this one is farsighted, right, so you're going to have that one. If they're near, then we get that same thing. We get the diverging light beam. And if they diverge, then the same lens focuses out here. So farsighted people tend to focus um, near objects behind the retina, which means a blurry image. So the correction there is to help the lens bend the light. Right? So if you put another lens here, it bends the light to make it parallel, then it focuses on the retina. So the corrective lens there is a convex, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a converging lens. This is called hyperopia. Myopia is nearsighted, hyperopia is farsighted. All right. Um, now let's talk a little bit about near point. What is the near point? The near point is for, for any person. What is the closest, um, without corrective lenses, the closest that you can move an object and still focus on it? See, i use one eye. Use this one. About right there. That's my near point for my right eye. This near point changes with age. Uh, always. Uh, typically, uh, young children have a very close near point sometimes within four inches, right? Very close. They can focus on things. Uh, as you get older, young adults, the near point moves out, you know, five or six inches away. Older adults past the age of 40, that near point moves out to maybe 10 inches, which is where mine is now. The reason for that has to do with aging of the lens. When the lens is new in a young child, it is very flexible, which means that it will, it can be made more round and focus from a closer image, right? For diverging rays can be brought to focus on the retina more easily. As you age, the, uh, the lens becomes less and less deformable. It cannot be changed shape more easily. So um, it becomes more difficult to focus things that are close. This is known as old eye, presbyopia. Presby means old, and opium, of course, means eye. Uh, that's why the uh, Presbyterian dom denomination got where it got its name. Presbyterians, those, those, that's a Christian denomination that's ruled by old people. Presbyterian, presbyopia, old eye. I say old people, um, the proper term is elders. It's elder rule. All right. So those are the those are the common defects of the uh, of the human eye. Now we want to talk about uh, some some wave effects that can be experienced for electromagnetic radiation 
due to the fact that it is a wave. We're, we're ignoring for now, we're ignoring the fact that it's also a particle. Now it's a wave. And this electromagnetic radiation, uh, by a review from last chapter, can be seen as propagating in this direction with a wave function for the electric field and a wave function for the magnetic field perpendicular to it. That's why it's called electromagnetic, because it's got uh, both an electric field and a magnetic field built in. And this is the wave structure of the light. Now, the, the first wave effect that we're going to talk about is polarization. Since light uh, has this uh, wave property, we can, well, actually it happens naturally, but we can artificially uh, restrict the passage of light to one plane of vibration of the wave. Because uh, most light beams are randomly oriented in their uh, in the way the direction that their waves move and if we restrict that by use of a polarizing filter uh, then we can say that now uh, in the extreme the light is linearly polarized right here it can be partially polarized too or it can be unpolarized Okay, so um, if you um, if you invest in a certain type of uh, sunglass, it may be made of a material that is designed to only pass light of one polarity. In other words, oriented a certain way. That Polaroid film um, can also be used to polarize uh, normal light. So if you hold, if you have uh, the Polaroid film, let's say we have light that goes like this, 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 and this, and we pass it through this Polaroid film, and it, it blocks everything but this direction. Okay, so this is oriented, um, let's see, let's make something up. Um, this is vertical. And if we have another film over here that's oriented horizontal, right, so it takes this film, it turns it that way, then nothing comes out the other side. We change the orientation of this filter so it blocks that light, okay? Now, the human eye can't detect uh, polarity, polarized light or unpolarized. It just, it's not built that way. But we do have devices that can do that. In this case, this is the polarizer and this is the analyzer. So this polarizes the light, and this analyzer will uh, tell you whether or not the light can pass. If the analyzer is oriented exactly the same way as the polarizer, then the light will pass. If it's turned right angles, then the light will not pass. We can use this phenomenon to investigate uh, various chemical materials, crystals usually. Um, if we shine light through a crystal, then the crystal will um, polarize the light in a certain direction. Okay. So this polarizer gives you light that's this way, and then you put your sample right here. Right? And it will take that polarized light and rotate it one way or the other, rotate it. And when the light comes out, 
uh, it'll be, uh, if it goes in this way, it might be rotated like that. Well, what you do then is you take your analyzer and you rotate the analyzer until it allows that light to pass at a given angle. So you establish the angle that allows the light to come through and then you measure <coughs> that angle relative to the polarizer and you know something about the crystal through which the light passed. It rotates the light, a polarized light, a certain amount. And then that gives you some indication as to uh, the, the physical, chemical nature of the crystal. Uh, these are crossed polarizers, right? No light comes out, right? I already showed you that one. Um, now, polarization of light is experimental evidence that light is a transverse wave. In other words, light, this is the direction of motion and the wave is like this. Transverse, right angles to the direction of motion. If it were a longitudinal wave, like sound, you would not be able to polarize it. It's impossible. You can't polarize compression. You can only polarize transverse. So that's how we know that light is a transverse wave because of this phenomenon. Um, here's a practical example. Some smart person figured out that uh, light reflecting from surfaces, say off of... Um, road surfaces, off of water surfaces, off of uh, the windshield of a car, tends to polarize the light um, in a horizontal direction, parallel to the ground, parallel to the surface. All right, now that we know that, your sunglasses can be made of polarized light that will block, let's back up, that act as a cross polarizer. In other words, the analyzer is on your eye. This glare that's produced by the reflection off of uh, horizontal surfaces can be blocked as long as you turn the polarizer 90 degrees. Then it will block that glare, but it will let other light through that is not polarized. No problem. Uh, and that's how uh, Polaroid lenses work. Uh, and you can prove that to yourself. Just take the sunglass on a bright day with glare and just take it <coughs> and rotate the glasses. 90 degrees, you're going to see glare coming through those glasses. Sunglasses, not these glasses. And then you rotate it back and it disappears. <clears throat> that's how we get rid of glare. In fact, I even wear my sunglasses at night, especially in, uh, on rainy nights, because the, uh, the glare coming from the falling raindrops and the, and the uh, oncoming headlights tend to produce excessive glare. So I put my sunglasses on, blocks out that glare, and uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't reduce the amount of light reaching my eyes so that I can't see where I'm going. In fact, when you put your sunglasses on, your eyes will compensate. In other words, your pupils will get bigger and take in more light. So uh, that's why I use my uh, sunglasses on rainy nights to combat the glare from oncoming headlights. All right. Uh, we can also use this phenomenon in microscopes. Uh, the light that shine through the specimen in your microscope is polarized. And then you have an analyzer uh, in the construction of the microscope that can be rotated to change the contrast based on the polarity of the light coming through the object and give you a better 
an enhanced image of the object. Uh, liquid crystal displays, LCDs, in your uh, televisions, your computer screens, your uh, smartphones. These are switchable polarizers. These liquid crystal displays are switchable polarizers. The light coming from behind the screen uh, is polarized. So the, uh, the, the screen in front of that polarized light can be switched to uh, Can we switch to non-polarizing or to cross-polarizing? So if it's cross-polarized, then it will block the light and give you a, a dark line or whatever figure uh, is um, being presented on the screen. And then if it's switched, switched off, then it's no longer polarizing as an analyzer uh, and the... Um, the light comes through as a bright field. So that way you can, you can create these symbols on the screen simply by switching polarity, electrically switching polarity. Okay, now here's another phenomenon of light uh, that is characteristic of the wave. Not characteristic of particles, characteristic of a wave. So if we have a, uh, a barrier here, and there's light coming through, draw our rays here, like that, those are light rays. If light behaved as a particle in this case, then these particles would be blocked and those particles would be traveling straight on. And if we had a screen over here, this would be black, and this would be light. Very, very precise and sharp uh, change from black to light. But we don't see that. We see actually um, a gradation of uh, gray. It grades from light to black. So what's happening here? It's a process called diffraction. And it's, it's characteristic of waves, not particles. So let's redraw our picture. For this barrier. Now if we look at light as a wave, when it hits that barrier, the barrier serves as a source, a wave source. So from this point, that point source produces a wave. And now over here we get a gradation from light to dark. So we get some um, blending from light to dark in this area. And that's due to the fact that light is a wave and behaving as a wave here, not as a particle. Another way to look at it is if we have a slit there. So as the wave approaches, this opening, this small slit, this pinhole or slit serves as a source. And the wave travels out from that source. So if the opening is very, 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 very small 
And the difference between the opening and the wavelength is more pronounced. That is, the slit is smaller, almost equal to a wavelength of the light. Then the diffraction is very pronounced. For instance, here, we see this. Here we have this different, we're using uh, water here, ripples in, in water, our wave, uh, as an analogy for diffraction. Light diffraction, excuse me. Um, so here's a wide slit, and we don't see much uh, diffraction, right? The, the wave tends to be linear all the way out here. Uh, excuse me. It's coming from the top. Excuse me. It's coming from the top, coming from the top. Okay, so now we get some bending, a little bit of bending here, but if we narrow the, the gap, we get huge, a, a much bigger bending of the, of the weight. That's pronounced diffraction. Okay, so um, let's see. Audible sound waves have wavelengths of in the order of centimeters to meters. Okay, between 20,000 hertz and 20, uh, 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. Right? So the wavelength by calculation gives you in the neighborhood of centimeters and meters of wavelength. Visible light, though, has wavelengths on the order of nanometers, much, much shorter wavelength. So in order to see diffraction for light, we need a very narrow gap, as opposed to sound where uh, a wider gap would produce uh, diffraction, noticeable diffraction. So how would we notice diffraction for sound? Well, if you have a loudspeaker over here and your ear is over here, <coughs> say your ear is over here, then if this is, um, say, couple of centimeters wide, you would be able to hear clearly over here because the wave would hit that and emanate from that point. But if you had a couple of centimeters here and you shined light on it, the light would essentially be a straight beam to the other side. Although you would see a little bit of fuzzy around the, uh, around the dot, you still get some diffraction. That's why you can hear sounds around a corner, but it's more difficult to see light around a corner. Okay. Um, this uh, fuzzy edge, this blurred edge of a shadow is the result of light diffraction. So the example here is in, you're in a movie theater sitting behind somebody. Uh, you can hear the sound just fine because sound diffracts around the person in front of you, but the light doesn't efficiently direct, diffract around that person, so you can't see the screen. All right. Radio, radio wave diffraction. Uh, radio waves have a... Uh, a wavelength for the AM spectrum of about 180 to 570 meters. Very long waves. FM is much shorter, 2.8 to 3.4 meters for the FM spectrum. Okay. So AM waves are more easily diffracted around buildings and other obstacles due to their longer wavelengths. So it's more difficult to lose the AM signal if you uh, go behind something, or say you go uh, down into a valley, and there's a, a mountain between you and the AM signal, very often you can still pick it up. There are a couple of reasons for that. One of them is diffraction, and the other, um, let me see, am I gonna talk about that? I'll introduce the topic anyway, uh, in just a second. So that leads to the concept of directionality. 
So the FM signal is more line of sight. Uh, you go behind the mountain, you lose your FM signal. So the, the diffraction over the mountain doesn't occur. Uh, AM, where, whereas AM, you can pick it up. There's another reason that you can pick up AM signals way, way, way far away. In fact, not just AM signals, but you can pick up short wave signals, which even have longer wavelengths. And uh, the reason for that is that in the upper atmosphere, uh, ionization of gases, which produces the plasma, remember we talked about that? The plasma produces, is, has the capability of reflecting waves. In other words, they enter that plasma and it reflects them. So uh, if this is the surface of the earth, then you can broadcast a signal from here, right? And it goes up here to the ionosphere and bounces off. And this person can uh, pick it up on their radio. Whereas this is AM, FM is blocked. And um, uh, ham radio operators operate at even longer wavelengths. And they are more efficient at, um, let's see, what did I say? AM, FM, uh, short wave. Short wave is even more efficient at using the ionosphere to bounce their signals. So uh, at nighttime, uh, you can tune your AM radio to stations that are on the other side of the country. Uh, I used to pick up Chicago regularly in Georgia. And the curvature of the Earth is not an obstacle because their signal bounces off the ionosphere and comes back down. The only reason you have to get it at night rather than in the day is because of uh, uh, interference from other signals. Stronger signals from other broadcasters and interference from uh, solar signals from the sun. So when the sun's overhead, it's generating its own radio waves. And only when it's below the horizon can you pick up these weaker signals from distant stations bouncing off the ionosphere. Okay, uh, we talked about interference. I'm gonna rehash this a little bit. Interference in the last discussion. So when two waves interact with one another, they are said to interfere. You can get a combination of interference, which is destructive or constructive. And this is based upon the principle of superposition. And this happens for any type of wave. When two waves interact, they superimpose, they superpo superpose upon one another. They combine their waveforms into a single waveform. <laughs> They can either reinforce or cancel uh, completely, or they can be anything in between. Right? So constructive interference is where uh, two peaks match and you get an increase in signal. Destructive is where you match a crest with a trough and they cancel one another out. And then there are gradations in between. All right, so here's an example. And we, we saw a video last time of two waves interacting when the discussion was about standing waves. And when they interact, they produce these various uh, types of uh, interactions, but then they pass one another and they go on their merry way. Now, um, I don't think I don't think we have a discussion 
let's see. I'm going to inter introduce a, a short topic here. It's called multiplexing. And it's, it's used, um, one form of multiplexing is how AM and FM radio signals are able to carry information to you. <clears throat> So you have, say you're tuned to uh, an AM station at, um, oh, I don't know, 600 kilohertz. If you tune your radio to 600 kilohertz, what does that actually do? When you tune your radio to 600 kilohertz, it cancels. It introduces a signal that cancels the 600 kilohertz. So if there's nothing there except for that signal, then you get nothing but maybe static. But what we do is we add um, an, um, an AM signal on top of that. And you get this, this waveform, whatever the case may be. And when you cancel the 600 kilohertz, what's left behind is the AM signal, which may be somebody talking. It may be music. Um, so that's how you transmit information on a radio signal. It's multiplexed. It's superimposed on that signal by this constructive and destructive interference. And when you subtract out this signal, you get left the information signal that was superimposed upon it in the first place. Okay. Now I say multiplexing because um, you can go on with several signals. In other words, you can have a, a parent signal, subtract it out, and you get another one which has actually several signals and superimposed on each other. You can split those out and you see you can, you can uh, incorporate large amounts of information on that single signal. And that's one of the ways that we get, uh, uh, we are allowed to transmit information over the internet by multiplexing. Okay, so for, uh, here's an example of this uh, interference, constructive and destructive interference, uh, in a practical example. It's called thin film interference. Anytime you see an oil film on the surface of water or uh, soap bubbles, you will usually see different colors. Well, those colors are able to um, constructively and destructively interference selectively for different colors. Part of the light is reflected from the front surface of the oil. In this case, we're talking about the, the thin film of oil. Um, part of the light is reflected from the surface and part of it goes through the oil and reflects off the, the water below. Well, what actually happens there? The reflective waves recombine as they strike the oil and the water and recombine as they exit and you see them as different colors. Here we go. So you get one part of the wave reflected here and another part down here reflected and then when they reach their your eye they recombine now if they recombine in such a way that um, blue light crests match from one match blue light crest uh, troughs from the other 
they will destructively interfere and the blue will disappear. And you'll have left the rest of the spectrum. Um, green, red, orange, yellow, those colors. So you can get various combinations depending on the thickness of the oil film because this difference here, this thickness difference, determines the phasing of the various light waves. So you change the thickness, you get different phasing, and that's why you get different colors. Um, let's see. Oh, good. I've got a slide on, on one coming up. Okay. So, suppose instead of one slit, we have two slits. All right, we have two slits here. Here, here, here. All right. So we have light of any wavelength or combination of wavelengths. Uh, for our example, it doesn't matter. So the light comes in here like this, like this, like this, and strikes this. And now this one produces a wave, and this one produces a wave. <coughs> and they propagate out like that. Okay? Now, as those waves interact, let's assume that this line is a crest and in between the line is a trough. Okay? So wherever these two lines intersect, we get a peak. And wherever a trough and a, a crest, inter, we get cancellation. So if we have a screen over here, what we get is um, Mm, let's see, how do I draw this? It's something like that. This means increased intensity. This means cancellation. And you get a series of these from those two slits. Here we go. So we have this, this slit producing waves here, this slit producing waves there, and when they combine, they produce light and dark. Okay. For the reds, in this case, you have, you have lots of red here and nothing there. And then the blues are shifted over a little bit, blues and, and less there. So you get this constructive and destructive interference from these slits. Well, this is only two slits. If you actually uh, put slits side by side, very finely dividing, close together, you can produce an image on this screen of a spectrum, just like a prism. But now it's work. It's based not on a refraction, but on diffraction, and we call that a diffraction grating. <coughs> Now, diffraction gratings can be transmission gratings or reflection gratings. And most of the ones I've seen in scientific instruments are reflection gratings. Simply because it, it makes for a more compact uh, instrument. Um, and notice that when we shine white light on this diffraction grating, we get this spectrum. Right? The interference, the diffraction of light, and the constructive and destructive interferences of different wavelengths of light cancel out some and reinforce others. So we get this spectrum from red to violet. Okay. That instrument that I mentioned earlier, the inductively coupled argon plasma spectrometer used a reflection grating rather than a prism to separate the light into its component wavelengths and then pick the ones out for the different elements uh, from their emission spectrum. 
it used a grating to do that. All right, so here are the, uh, actually I left out one of the formulas. I should have put that one in there. I want to write it up here. So we have this definition of index of refraction, which is the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in the medium. Okay. And then we get the uh, spherical mirror where the focal length is equal to one half of the radius of cult. Uh, well, the radius of cu uh, curvature. That's the C is the point. This is the radius of cur curvature. So the focal length equals one half of the radius of curvature. And then the last one, uh, index of one medium times the sine of the angle equals, this is Snell's law. Okay, so that you can tell the angle of refraction. Okay, so those three are the principal formulas out of this chapter. Chapter seven, optics and wave effects.